great. I haven't talked to Russell or Barbara yet. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Miller Center. Real quick announcement here before we get started. This should be a exciting one today. If you've got a cell phone or anything that looks like a cell phone, could you please put it in vibrate mode, turn it off, or somehow just make it not go off during the show? We would appreciate it. We're going to get started here in just a few seconds. Thanks. Would you want to come around here? Yeah. Yeah. That way we don't have to move the chairs. Yeah. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Good thank, morning. You, thank you for being here today. We're so delighted to have you. Uh, welcome to the Miller Center. For those of you who are uh, new to our space and enjoying the Williamsburg effect here, we're, we're glad to have you. And I see many dear friends and uh, people who come frequently to Miller Center forums. I uh, always want to thank our team, um, our technical team, certainly led by Mike Greco, but also uh, Christina lopez Guitardi chow uh, who runs our forums and does such a superb job of planning them. Um, I'm Barbara Perry, for those of you who might not know me, and I direct presidential studies here at the Miller Center, uh, along with uh, co-chairing with uh, my colleague Russell Riley, the Presidential Oral History Program. Uh, so we are finishing up the Bush 43 project, uh, we are just starting into the Obama project, and next week we head out to Little Rock for our third interview with President Clinton uh, as part of that project. So we have many things that uh, we're working on in that area. Um, this has been just a delight over the last year to work on this new project 
uh, what we're calling the untold story of JFK's valet, George Thomas. And we'll, we'll talk more in detail of how we got here, uh, but I want to introduce my colleagues. First of all, to my uh, far left is Alfred Reeves IV, and Alfred is the faculty coordinator here in the Presidential Studies Program, um, and he holds his degree in political science from uh, James Madison University. Uh, some of you might also know Alfred if you come to our programs. He's very helpful at uh, getting all the logistics uh, settled on that. And and then to uh, Alfred's uh, right is uh, our, our star and guest of honor today is, is Nick Drake. And Nick is a poet, screenwriter, and playwright uh, from the UK. Uh, he attended Cambridge University. Uh, and this is how this entire story began, our, our journey uh, to find uh, what we're calling perhaps the hidden figure uh, in the President Kennedy uh, orbit, and that is uh, Mr. George Thomas. And this came about because, uh, Nick, about this time last year, I think it was, it was in the spring, uh, reached out uh, via email to me, uh, as many researchers do, uh, media researchers, historians. Uh, my colleague Mark Silverstone is here, who heads our presidential recordings program. I, I can't, I've lost count of the, the media requests that we get and the historians and political scientists and teachers and occasional students who are working on their History Day projects will email us or call with questions about the presidency because the Miller Center is really the center of the universe when it comes to studying the presidency, and particularly President Kennedy. This is an expertise of, of uh, Mark's and, and I hope of mine as well. So thank goodness Nick reached across the ocean via the internet to say, I am writing a play on the summit meeting between <coughs> Prime Minister Harold McMillan and President John F. Kennedy in the summer of 1963 that took place at Birch Grove, which was the uh, ancestral home of Macmillan in Sussex uh, in England. And he said, I'm, I'm taking a different approach to it. I, I'd like to include as a character in my play President Kennedy's valet, George Thomas, who was there uh, serving President Kennedy. In fact, stayed in the Birch Grove home of Harold Macmillan. And he said, I've, I've found a little bit about him, but I, I just can't find very much. So, well, that's the challenge that we love here. Mm -hmm. Someone calls and says, I can't find very much about something you might know about. So I said, all right, um, I know the name, and I know he was President Kennedy's valet, and that's about all I know. So I'll start going back through biographies and studies of the Kennedy years and Mrs. Kennedy's oral history. And I kept finding a reference here, a reference there to, to George Thomas, um, but that was it. And he was literally a footnote in, in the Kennedy story. With that, I called in Alfred. <laughs> and we discovered that uh, George Thomas had been from Berryville, Virginia. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause there and keep you in suspense once we found that out to see where, where it took us because now I want to introduce another crucial member of our panel, Professor David Throop. David and I have known each other for more decades than I will allow and he is not allowed to say how many decades I have known him, but just to say I stood up for him and his wife, Julia, at their wedding at the chapel here. They met as graduate students uh, here at the university. Actually, I think David was already a professor by then. Um, David comes to us via England, uh, did his bachelor's degree and PhD at Cambridge in history. He read history there and also holds a graduate degree from the London School of economics. He's an expert on British politics, uh, particularly on this Cold War period in, in which Kennedy and Macmillan meet at Birch Grove. Uh, David is also an African historian and has served as a diplomat in the British uh, Foreign Office um, with a particular expertise on Kenya. And we just discovered that uh, Nick's dad, who was a Czech emigre to England, was in the British Army yes. and served in Kenya. Yes. So they had a lot to talk about in the green room, <laughs> but that's a whole nother panel, all right? We'll do that tomorrow. We'll do that tomorrow. <laughs> And the really wonderful news is that after UVA Today published an article on the findings that yep. Alfred and I had begun to share with Nick, uh, George Sampson from the, is George here? He'll George. be here later. Okay, yeah. so George is from the art department here. He read the story in UVA Today and said, wouldn't it be great to have Nick Drake come and do a residence at UVA for this entire week as a playwright in residence? 
Uh, and so George received a Thrive grant from the University of Virginia to bring Nick here. So he's been able to expand on his research, made a trip to Berryville, Virginia, the home of George Thomas yesterday, expanding on his research, but will also be giving um, a conversation, the Keenan uh, lecture tomorrow evening, I believe that is. Right. Is it this oh, evening? Right. Yeah. Uh, at the architecture school. So if you want more about playwriting, uh, you have an opportunity to do that. And then you're speaking at the Jefferson School downtown to students uh, in particular, it's I think. Non stop. Yes, yeah, so, it's, so we're, we're making the most of his visit here. JFK's trip to Europe had nothing on this. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, um, let me turn to um, just actually, I guess, just to get started mm -hmm. with our, um, our PowerPoint here. What Alfred and I did was to uh, commit some of our initial thoughts about Camelot uh, and uh, George Thomas in Camelot. Uh, to just introduce you to that concept, but also our questions that we'll be putting to our panelists today. Um, we also committed to PowerPoint, so we would have some uh, pictures and visuals along with it. Uh, and then we'll always, as we do here at UVA Forums, uh, at the Miller Center, we're going to hold another 15 or 20 minutes for you to ask questions before we get to our stopping point at 12.15. But um, how many of you remember the Camelot legend being introduced by Jacqueline Kennedy after President Kennedy's assassination? Fascination. Many, many of you do. Um, and do you remember where it appeared? Where it first appeared that Mrs. Kennedy used that, that categorization to call it Camelot? It was Life Magazine. Uh, she called uh, Theodore White, the great uh, Life Magazine columnist, up to Hyannis Port uh, one week after her husband's horrific assassination. If you saw the movie Jackie, the, a lot of that movie is based on the interview that she did with Theodore White. Uh, but she cited these lyrics from the Lerner and Lowe musical that had been very popular in the early 60s. And she said that President Kennedy at night uh, liked to listen to the cast album with uh, Richard Burton, you see them here, Richard Burton and, and Julie Andrews and Robert Goulet, uh, and that his, uh, President Kennedy's favorite lyric was, uh, don't let it be forgot that once there was a spot for one brief shining moment known as Camelot. And she said, there'll be great presidents again, but there'll never be another Camelot. And it stuck. People still refer to the Kennedy administration as Camelot. And I always think it's fascinating that, that she layered a legend upon a legend. Of course, the Arthurian legend, the British legend of King Arthur. And then she layered another legend of her husband's golden moment uh, as Camelot. And I always say, well, there, was, there, was a, there are two things that were true about that lyric. It was brief. It was a brief presidency, as of 136 days between the inauguration and the assassination. And it was shining. All you have to do is look at this couple. And they were effervescent. They were effervescent in color. They were effervescent in black and white. And then they had these two beguiling children. Uh, and it, it made it all the more poignant when the president was lost. And my good friend Barry Battle is here today. And she, she knew President Kennedy. And she spent time with the family. And she knew Teddy and Bobby here when they were at the law school. And her husband, uh, Bill Battle, was the ambassador to Australia uh, for President Kennedy. And, and uh, Ambassador Battle had been a crewmate, had been with Jack Kennedy uh, in the South Pacific during World War II. So Barry always shares these stories with us the, uh, from her personal experience. I don't think it's too much to say they were a shining, effervescent couple. Uh, Barry says that is the case. So Nick, we're going to turn to you to ask you how you came upon this idea uh, in the course of your playwriting. And we should say Nick has written other history-based plays, uh, one on Handel and the Messiah, as yeah. I understand, the writing of the Messiah by, by Handel, the composer, has also written um, a trilogy uh, that's based in historic Egypt mm -hmm. in the 18th century. He told me that wasn't his we favorite. Don't talk about that. Uh, we're not, he said, we're not going to talk about that. So, but, I, but I put the cover of the, the Handel piece up. Yeah. So um, yeah. tell us um, how, as a playwright, you decide to pick a historical topic and write a play around it. Well, OK. I think, first of all, you don't, you don't really decide and you don't really pick. What you have to do, I think, as a writer, is you just have to keep your ears open for an interesting story. And that may not be a big story. It may be actually a very small story. It may just be a detail in another story. But for whatever reason, there's something in that story that awakens something of interest and curiosity. 
and a sense that what if I explored that, what would I, what would I find? So I was telling David just now, because he asked me where, where this started, the, the beginning of this play, because I never thought I would write a play about Kennedy and Macmillan. I knew, to be honest, nothing about them. <laughs> uh, I never thought I would write about George Thomas. I didn't, I didn't know anything about him either. But a friend of mine went to stay at Kennedy's, uh, uh, so Macmillan's country house, Birch Grove, and she looked in the visitor's book, and the first name in the visitor's book was John F. Kennedy, a signature. So she told me about this, and um, we were both kind of curious about that. So we looked into uh, the story of that weekend, uh, his visit. We looked into the relationship between the two men, which was important and close, although perhaps complex, between a, a charismatic young president and an elderly conservative prime minister. Um, and they, there is an agenda for that weekend, but what we also think we know is that the two men stayed up late talking. And I don't think there's a record of what they talked about. But that kind of empty space between the arrival and the departure struck me as very, very interesting. To try and think about or try and imagine what it would be like to be those two men, as we put, as we put it, leaders of the world, what would they talk about? They would talk about what they needed to talk about, but they might talk about all sorts of other things. They might talk about their marriages. They might talk about disappointment. They might talk about ambition. They might talk about how they wanted to change the world and leave it a little less brick and a little more marble. I was very interested in that kind of empty space, the gap between them. And Macmillan, in his diaries, wrote that, that although it was a, a high-level uh, international meeting, it was more like a play or the rehearsal for a play, which also struck me as very curious and very interesting <laughs> because I wanted to write a play. <laughs> So it took, you know, instead of taking place at Downing Street with all the paraphernalia, all the grandeur of a political meeting, this meeting took place in a very domestic setting, uh, deliberately so, invited there by, uh, by, by Macmillan uh, to his private house. So I was very curious about what the, why he did that, what were the reasons for that, and what was he trying to get out of it. Um, what else was interesting about it? Um, well, of course, the other thing that's interesting about it is that this, although the characters didn't know it, this was going to be the last time they met. And within five months, John F. Kennedy would be assassinated. And so for a play, a playwright, that framing, that terrible elegiac framing, uh, is very powerful and very appealing. So, so I'm trying to sort of describe to you the, the parts the elements that intrigued me about this story and why I felt there was something really interesting about it. I was interested, as I was about Obama, about anybody who, who stands at the top of power. What must it be like to deal with all the things that come at you all the time, every single day, all the conflicts, the things that you want to do, the things that you fail to do, having to deal not just with your own idealism or your own pragmatism, but with the opposition, with the enemy, with how difficult it is to get anything through in terms of politics, how is it possible to make the world a better place? And I had a sense that they both were idealists in that they wanted to do that for different reasons. So, so how do things change in the world? So all of these things were part of what my interest was in this area of the play. So this is all the Cold War. Uh, Cuba was the year before. But then I began to understand that this was not the only thing that was happening in world and American politics. Of course, civil rights were happening at the same time. Hugely important history. And then I began to think about this, this you know, we call him a footnote because, because he's a, apparently a very, very minor character in the story, George Thomas, JFK's valet, who was with him for 16 years, which is, I think, largely uh, John F. Kennedy's political career. So this is a fantastically interesting relationship. What was that relationship like? In a sense, it's a relationship between a master and servant. But that embodies the problem that civil rights was trying to confront. Mm 
And yet, in service, there are beautiful things about taking care of another person. There's great dignity in that as well. But there may also be indignity in that, about what you may or may not be able to say. So I, you know, I got in touch with, with Barbara and Alfred, and we began to look into the story of George Thomas. And more and more, I felt um, a kind of necessary responsibility to do right by him to bring him up in the story, uh, to give him a role of gravity and complexity so that he can carry the history of civil rights into this other story, which is what I thought I was writing about. But then it turned into something else, which is, of course, as a writer, what you always want. You don't want to write about what you think you know. You want to write about what surprises you. In fact, you want the writing to help you discover what you didn't know. So that's how I, how I came to write this play. Uh, it's a kind of zigzag of associations. Um, I'm not a historian. I say that. <laughs> that's why David I'm is I'm not here. a historian. Um, so as a, as a writer, one looks for the, the dramatic elements and the character elements in the history. And the history is daunting because there is so much of it. There's so much about Kennedy. There's so much about Macmillan. And I was trying to look at one weekend at the end of June, 1963. I was trying to look at two people, and then at George Thomas as well. And the fact that there is so much about these men, and so little about George Thomas, well, it upset me. And I wanted to do something about that. So that's, um, that's why I'm here, is to, is to stand on the land where he lived, and to try and understand um, the life that he lived, the kind of man he was, what options and what possibilities or what limitations he had in the choices that he could make in his life and how he lived that life. And it turned out to be a very important life. From Berryville to the White House, that is an important life. And I don't want that to be forgotten. In fact, quite the opposite. I want it to be remembered. Um, so, you know, I'm a white British playwright. <laughs> <laughs> I did not expect to, I did not expect to be here. <laughs> Least of all writing George Thomas. So I'm aware that there are complexities about this. And I'm aware that the representation of African American people in art has been poor. Stereotypes, perpetuation of all sorts of appalling things. So I, I don't want to do that. But I've got a lot to learn. So coming here and meeting people and breathing the air and seeing the places and going to Berryville and going to the street where he lived and seeing his house, these are very powerful things for me. So that's, that's roughly my story. Thank you. You can see why Alfred and I were compelled uh, to, to join in this project. So David, I'm going to, and we'll be coming back to Nick often, of course, in our conversation, but I want to turn to our historian uh, to ask David about the relationship between John F. Kennedy and Macmillan. How many times did they meet? Um, you're a historian of the Cold War period, of British politics. What's happening in American politics, in British politics, in world politics? And when I first asked David about this, he said, well, of course you'll read the six volumes of Harold Macmillan's <laughs> memoir. And I said, I've, of course I don't think I will have that time. But I think David had already brought the first volume to dinner and was reading it as his wife and I chatted. So um, David is up to speed on this, uh, to be sure. How many times um, did Macmillan and Kennedy get together during that 1,036 days of the Kennedy presidency, and why, and where? Well, they met five times. Um, you might think it a little strange, because they, they were actually related. Um, Kennedy's sister, Kathleen, uh, was married to Macmillan's nephew, the Marquis of Hartington. Uh, and you might have thought that when Joe Kennedy was the ambassador to the court of St. James at the end of the 1930s, that they would have met because um, the courtship was already underway. But they didn't. Uh, and therein lies a story that perhaps we might go into. Uh, but they did meet uh, when Macmillan was prime minister and Kennedy was president. Uh, the first time was March 1961, 
Uh, Macmillan was touring the then British colonies in the West Indies. And he was staying at Government House Trinidad. And there was a flare-up crisis in Laos. And the uh, American administration wanted to twist Britain into supplying troops at, for possible engagement in Laos. Uh, and so Kennedy got in contact with Macmillan when he was in Port of Spain uh, and said, would he come uh, to meet him uh, in, um, in Florida, uh, come down to Key West uh, and fly over to an American uh, Air Force base and have a discussion about the deteriorating situation uh, in Laos. Uh, so that was the first meeting. Uh, and of course, to get from Trinidad uh, to Key West, uh, it was quite a convoluted process because you couldn't fly over Cuba. Uh, <laughs> and they, they had quite a protracted journey there. Uh, so that was the first encounter. And there were only three British uh, representatives at the meeting. There was Harold Casey, uh, who was the ambassador here in Washington. Uh, there was Tim Bly, who was the prime minister's uh, private secretary, and there was Macmillan himself. So it was a very small British delegation where there were large numbers of Americans. The second time they met was... was and David, can I pause there? Did they get on? Did, did, did Kennedy and Macmillan get on I initially? I think they got on reasonably well. Uh, basically, the end result was that Britain refused to provide troops uh, <laughs> for participation in Laos. Uh, so, so Kennedy didn't get what he wanted. Uh, but uh, th that was the first meeting, and I think they got on reasonably well. Uh, the second meeting uh, was uh, two months later in May. 1961. Uh, and that followed two major events. Uh, it followed Kennedy's state visit to Paris and his encounter with the general. Uh, so uh, Macmillan was interested in getting a, a reading on what Kennedy thought of de Gaulle. Uh, and immediately after the state visit to France, uh, Kennedy had met Khrushchev at their first summit in Vienna. And that had been a very, very difficult encounter. Uh, Khrushchev had not been uh, in a good mood. He wanted to put Kennedy through the ringer, uh, particularly after the Bay of Pigs uh, and the new president. Uh, and so it was a very, very combative uh, session. And I think that, that Kennedy was, was overwhelmed by the animosity uh, that came from Khrushchev. Uh, so there was an excuse, how, how, how stop over in London ostensibly to see uh, Princess Radzivill's uh, new child. This was uh, Kennedy's sister-in-law. This was Kennedy's sister-in-law, who lived quite close to Buckingham Palace, actually. Um, so Macmillan went out to Heathrow Airport uh, and drove with um, Kennedy and his wife into uh, central London, um, and, and discussing, and uh, they had subsequent meetings um, for about an hour and a half uh, when uh, Kennedy gave Macmillan a readout of what had happened with, with de Gaulle and a more protracted discussion about the relationship with Khrushchev and how Khrushchev had really been quite hostile and quite difficult uh, at Vienna, testing Kennedy uh, as the new president. So that was, I think, uh, a more substantive and more interesting meeting, uh, if in, in indeed uh, a more informal meeting. Uh, the third meeting uh, took place at the end of December uh, 1961, just before Christmas, 21st of December, um, and took place in Bermuda. Uh, and this was, was both sides' team uh, brought quite significant uh, teams of officials to discussions. Uh, and there were four issues. There was the crisis in Berlin, uh, which uh, basically was the follow-on from Vienna. Uh, Khrushchev's reading of Kennedy had been that he was a, a political lightweight uh, who could be given a, a difficult time, uh, and, and therefore there was the escalation of Soviet pressure uh, over the political situation in Berlin. Um, so that was the first issue they talked about. Then they talked about atmospheric nuclear tests uh, 
Macmillan was very eager that there should be a move to a treaty banning atmospheric testing uh, of nuclear weapons, and he was pushing that on Kennedy uh, at the same time diplomatically he was pushing it on Khrushchev. Uh, the third issue they talked about was the political crisis in the Congo uh, and the UN deployment in the Congo. And December 1961 is a crucial moment in the conflict in the Congo where the UN mission is morphing from a chapter six peacekeeping mission into a semi-chapter seven peace enforcement mission uh, where the UN troops will move into Katanga, the secessionist province in the south, and basically break the secession. So this is a, a key moment in uh, the political evolution of the UN deployment uh, in the Congo crisis. And then the, the final thing, Britain has just applied to join the European Economic Community, <laughs> uh, which uh, the United States was rather enthusiastic about. Uh, and Macmillan was, was interesting to, to, dis, to, to tell uh, Kennedy about how the negotiations were going uh, and maybe to, to try and find out how the United States could assist those negotiations. The fourth meeting was a year later. And this was the most important meeting. This was absolutely crucial as far as Britain was concerned. And that is the 19th of December meeting in the Bahamas uh, and NASA. Uh, in 1960, in March 1960, uh, Macmillan had met his old chum, uh, President Eisenhower. And uh, this was a very difficult moment. Uh, as far as Britain was concerned. Uh, the development of the British missile to fire a nuclear bomb uh, had run into difficulties. And it had been decided by the British government to cancel development of what was called Skybolt. And Macmillan went to see Eisenhower and said, can you provide a delivery system for the British bomb? And Eisenhower said, yes, you can have a choice. You can either uh, have uh, Skybolt instead of Blue Streak, which is, is being canceled, uh, which is an air delivery system uh, using perhaps your existing Vulcan bombers. Uh, or you can have the new thing we're developing, which is Polaris, which is a nuclear uh, bomb system uh, but not from aircraft, from nuclear submarines. Uh, and Macmillan said, well, uh, as we're already using the Air Force, why don't we stick with the Air Force? Uh, Blue Streak was to be uh, an Air Force delivered missile, so why don't we opt for Skybolt? So that was signed, sealed, and agreed in March 1960. In December 1962, the United States government cancelled development of Skybolt, which meant that the British had a nuclear bomb, but they didn't have any means of delivering it. <laughs> uh, and so there was this crisis meeting with Kennedy in the Bahamas, uh, in which basically uh, Kennedy was coming to beg uh, the Americans to change their mind, to keep on with development of Skybolt or to provide an alternative delivery system. And Kennedy said, well, we don't want Skybolt. We've decided it's, it's too expensive and it, it, it doesn't meet our needs. And there's been this battle between the um, Air Force and the Navy. And it has been decided that the United States will go with Polaris, that basically this internal American conflict in the Pentagon has been won by the Navy and the, and the Air Force have lost out. Uh, however, as you are dependent on Skybolt, we will spend 200 million more dollars developing it, provided you contribute 200 million dollars towards the development costs and then you can buy it. Uh, but we're not interested in buying it. If, if we, we go ahead with the development of Skybolt, which is already 
cost us a great deal of money, and, and, and it's, it's not quite clear how much it will end, cost in the end, but we're estimating, estimating probably another $400 million. Uh, you've got to cough in half of it uh, in the development, uh, and you can have it, but we're not interested. So Macmillan said, well, we don't want to be fobbed off with, with something you're not going to have, some second-rate development. So can we have Polaris? Eisenhower had said we could have Polaris. And Kennedy was very reluctant and, and eventually was persuaded to offer Britain the Polaris option, which Macmillan accepted. But is the, this causing tension, David? In this is a major problem. In, Both in between the two countries and the two men? Not be, well, it's a major problem between the two countries because this is a major breakdown, really, in policy making in the United States. The, the result is that President Kennedy appoints Richard Neustadt uh, to conduct a commission of inquiry to produce the Neustadt report as to how come when we cancel Skybolt, nobody thought about the Brits. You know, we, we were committed to the Brits on the development of Skybolt, but when we cancelled, we were so preoccupied by the conflict between the US Navy and the US Air Force that nobody considered the ramifications in terms of quite important ally. Uh, and, and so Kennedy's very concerned about this, and Newstat uh, is brought to, to investigate how the decision-making process took place. And interestingly, and, and we and always report. call upon the, the great name of Richard Newstat, who was a presidential, the dean of presidential scholars in the United States, was at Columbia and ended up at Harvard, worked really closely with the Kennedy family in developing the Institute of Politics at Harvard and Kennedy's name after his death. And he writes a, a seminal book in 1960 called Presidential Power, and the famous line from it is, the power of the president is the power to persuade. And one of the constituencies he has to persuade, obviously, is foreign powers and, and foreign officials and foreign leaders. Um, so this takes us to Birch Grove. And bef before we get to Birch Grove, I'll again hold in suspense. So David, hold off one moment. And let us move on to um, me. Um, <laughs> and that is that, as we said earlier, most biographies of uh, President Kennedy or even uh, books about Macmillan and Kennedy, and there's a very good one um, that I've downloaded on Kindle recently, and there's also a, a, a teeny one um, that's, I think, self-published you can get on Amazon uh, called uh, Kennedy and Macmillan at Birch Grove. Mm -hmm. Um, but there again, they, they do mention that, that uh, George Thomas was there and was at the summit and stayed there. But we, we, Alfred and I started working on it and we said, we've got to find more. There's bound to be more on this man. So we went to two books, Death of a President, written by William Manchester, which was the authorized version of the story of Kennedy's death that Bobby Kennedy and Jacqueline Kennedy had uh, commissioned uh, William Manchester, the historian at Wesleyan University, who had written a portrait of a president, a, a very um, a favorable, effusively favorable book about Kennedy while he was alive. They thought, well, we'll, we'll trust him to write the official account of the assassination. And he does talk quite a lot about George Thomas, and that's where Alfred and I discovered that George Thomas was from, from, Maryville. from, from Berryville, yeah. Virginia, which, of course, immediately piqued our interest. And then there was a book, a little tiny book called A Day in the Life of President Kennedy, written by Jim Bishop, a popular story uh, that was being, the, the finishing touches Jim Bishop was putting on this little book uh, when the president was assassinated. But he had been invited in the fall of 1963 to spend several days at the White House. Mm -hmm. And he begins his book with the beginning of a day in the life of President Kennedy, begins with George oh, Thomas yes. coming down from the third floor bedroom where he stayed at the White House mm -hmm. to knock on the president's bedroom door to say, Mr. President, you know, 7.30, time, time to get up. Yeah, he would go down to the kitchen and have a conversation with the cooks before he'd go back up and check if the president was ready. So. Exactly. And then, so then we said, well, then maybe the Kennedy Library has 
uh, an interview. Mm -hmm. we, you know, we do presidential oral history here, but the Kennedy oral history was done at, by Arthur Schlesinger leading the way at the Kennedy Library. Um, and so Mark Silverstone was, was up at the library recently to, to do research, and we had him check again. There is no oral history interview of George Thomas. There is of Mrs. Kennedy's maid, personal assistant, called um, Providencia oh, Paredes. She did an interview, and she died a couple of years ago, and her son deeded over that interview, which mm -hmm. talks about the fact that she, Mrs. Kennedy's maid, and George Thomas yep. went to Vienna <coughs> to the summit, to the Khrushchev now, summit. Wasn't it the case that they got left there, too? And yeah. they got <laughs> left behind. Yeah. They, their, their, job, their job is the assistants, the valet and the maid, where the Kennedys would leave their hotel room mm -hmm. after having these summitries and state dinners, and they'd be whisked off to Air Force One out at the airport, and then George and, and Provy, she was called, would come in and pack up the President and Mrs. Kennedy's luggage and then go meet them at the airport. And they do all that, and they get out to the airport, and they see the plane is left. So <laughs> This was a major part of, of Provy's oral history, but we can't find an oral history interview with George. Yeah. So Alfred tracks down that William Manchester, who interviewed virtually everyone um, involved at, at all with the president leading up to the assassination, yeah. that there was an interview. And then um, Sheila Blackford, our librarian, tracked it yeah. down at Wesleyan in the archives. So this has been a, a Miller Center team effort, yeah. um, got the interview. And I want to turn to Alfred now to say, what did you learn about George Thomas from that interview that William Manchester did with him? He paid a lot of attention to detail. He was a very detail-oriented person. Like every every shoe had its place, every suit had to be, you know, on to perfection. He he focused on the particulars of everything and made sure that they were in the right place at the right time when Kennedy needed them. So it was. Uh, I can't really, you know, think of the best way to describe it, but, he, you know, he, it was almost like that was an instrumental part of his life and he had to make sure that he had it done to perfection almost. And it was a bit of a perfection. And you can see from this photo here, there are v actually very few photos of George Thomas, but we've yeah. tracked down three or four from the White House collection taken by the White House photographer. This was at President Kennedy's last birthday. May 29th, 1963, and they had a surprise party for him at the White House in what's called the White House Mess, which is a Navy mess. It's run by the, by the Navy. Um, in fact, Bill Antholis and Mark and I and Mel Leffler and Bill Antholis, we all, Russell Riley, we all went up recently and, and had, uh, at the end of the Obama administration, we had lunch there with part of his national security team. So you can see this is the White House Mess. Kennedy comes in as surprised by his staff. It's for the staff. Mm -hmm. And there is George Thomas to his right. And so when Alfred talks about the detail orientation of uh, George Thomas, you can actually see it in how he dresses and how he helps President Kennedy dress. And this was very important because Kennedy was a slob. He was a slob. And so before he married Jackie, who saw that he dressed as properly as possible, and before George came on the scene in 1947, as mm -hmm. Kennedy went yep. into Congress, Kennedy was just known for dressing sloppily. He had kind of that prep school air about him, that it didn't matter how he looked. Um, he was handsome. He was naturally handsome. But he just was, didn't care about his clothes. He was a bachelor, and he didn't care about his clothes. But you can see that certainly by the time he gets to the White House, his suits were always perfectly tailored, and his ties were perfectly tied, and his white shirts were always perfectly pressed and ironed and, and ready to go. Um, so let, let's move on to um, George's life and a picture sure that Nick, in his research yep. just last week, was able to track down, and this is the earliest photo now. Where did you find this, Nick? Well, Moral Caldian, who is an architectural historian based in Berryville, found this. <gasps> so thank you to Moral for this. Here, here is George, nine years old. He's circled. Yeah. He's yeah. with his class. And his brother James is farther down the, at the very end of the row. So they're both in that picture. Right. So, and he's, he was one of how many children? Six or six, six children. Six children yeah. Born in a li wide spot in the road. So Alfred and I made a trip yeah. up to Berryville in the fall to meet with George's uh, surviving uh, friends and neighbors yeah. who are still there in Berryville. 
Uh, and the reason I called Alfred in to help with the research, and he's had a key part of it, is that Alfred comes from a small town in central Virginia. We're That's so glad to have his family here. Race. So I, I knew that if I, if I put Alfred on the case, that he was going to track down as much as there was to find about <coughs> George Thomas. Uh, and then I'm also going to call on, on Carrie. Uh, Matthew's here, uh, works directly uh, with Mark in, in PRP, but she's also also uh, a historian uh, in her own right, works here at the Albemarle, Charlotte's, Albemarle County Charlottesville Historical Society, and she began finding census data for us. Mm -hmm. So she found all of this census data to help us track the story of George, that he's born in this wide spot in the road that Alfred and I, if you blink, you would miss it on yep. the way to yes. Little Berryville yeah. in the Shenandoah Valley. Berryville is about eight miles from Winchester, beautiful part of the, of the Commonwealth, yep. as you can imagine, very close to the West Virginia border, yep. in fact. Um, and that Nick's just come back from Berryville and saw a one-room schoolhouse that they've preserved mm -hmm. uh, called the Josephine Community School. We think that is the kind of school that George would have gone to. Yep. Um, you see. Uh, I think a cleric up in the top left hand corner. Many of these one room schoolhouses for uh, African Americans at that time were taught by clerics, uh, many of whom would come down from the north. Uh, the Josephine School, I think, was founded by scholars from, from Dartmouth. Um, college, um, but we, we discovered that he did have this basic education, um, that he had moved from this small town as, at the age of two to Berryville, um, and that uh, he began life as a, a delivery boy in, in his service yeah, he, of, as a delivery boy. He was uh, born in uh, 1908 uh, to Jacob and Mary Thomas. Um, thanks to Nick's research, we actually found out that Jacob was, his father was a farmhand and labor and they actually rented a place before they actually moved to Berryville. So it's and of course, farming yeah. is so important there. You're right in the heart of apple country. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, uh, when we talked to his friends, George's friends and relations, they said so often uh, children, of course, would be pulled out of school in the summer for planting and in the fall for harvest, harvesting apples, harvesting wheat. We didn't hear that, that George had himself did that, although maybe if they, they had a farm, perhaps he did as a yeah, young boy. Yeah, his, his friends said they didn't know whether or not he actually, you know, he only had a seventh grade education. So he may have begun working right after that, either as a server or a cook, but I don't remember them telling us that he had worked at any time in Right, court. we didn't know that he did any agricultural work. Yeah. We did uh, hear that he served uh, Senator Harry Byrd, the, the famous or infamous uh, senator from Virginia, yes. the, the segregationist uh, who lived in Winchester. And so George began <coughs> serving at parties at his house. He also served for a, a private family in the, the Berryville. McGee's is what they were called. That's right, mm -hmm. that's right. So the key then connection to Kennedy, as Nick said, is that he works with Kennedy for his entire political career from the moment he goes to Congress. How, tell us, uh, Alfred, how does George get to Kennedy? Well, he, he had this interesting story. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, he gets to Kennedy, basically, he's picked up uh, from one of uh, Kennedy's friend, Arthur Crock, and he's working at, under him as a, as a server, I believe. And now we had discussion about this of how his services were donated to Kennedy, um, which I still don't quite understand. <laughs> <laughs> um, we know that we know that Arthur Crock. This is what we read is that Arthur Crock owed some kind of debt to yes. Joseph P. Kennedy, Kennedy's father, and in payment, yes. this is what Alfred's referring. In payment of that debt, he offered the services of his, his assistant, assistant servant valet. Yeah. George, and then Kennedy said, well, my son Jack has just been elected to Congress, and he's a slob, and he right. needs, he's right. got to have somebody, he's not married, and he's right. going off to Washington, he needs somebody to care for him. George was, in a sense, his right-hand man at that point. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. 
In the White House, we find a couple more pictures, and again, another one at the birthday party in May of 63, and to the president's left is Pro V. Paradis, Mrs. Mm -hmm. Kennedy's uh, uh, maid, and then George looking so proud, not quite hugging the flag as our current president does, but standing really closely uh, to, the, to the flag with the president seated in between, um, and just again, looking so proud to be there and to be a part of this. And then one I just find so precious is the one to the left. This is up in, the, we think, the family quarters of the White House. That's little John Jr., John Kennedy Jr., at about age two, um, with uh, George uh, just bending over him as the little boy's banging around on the mm -hmm. piano keys. But it, it, we, we use this because it shows how close he was to the family, mm -hmm. that he was part of the family. Uh, and again, lived on the third floor of the White House, just above the family quarters uh, in, in the White House. Um, do we want to play, uh, Alfred, this yeah. little clip? Now, we, we're grateful to Mark and to Carrie for finding this. This is the only recording so far we have of Thomas's voice. And it is a, f a phone call that Evelyn Lincoln, President Kennedy's secretary, called over to the family quarters and asked George, when is the president coming over to the Oval Office? So you have to listen closely. And this is what Mark and his team do all the time. They listen to tapes. Um, so Alfred's going to roll this for it. So listen carefully. Yes, George, is he resting yet? He is. Yes. I'll call him in uh, 3.30. At 3.30. Uh. OK, well, I'm not called. Well, when he wakens, ask him if he wants the uh, memo on uh, that deals with his four o'clock meeting. What if I should send that over to him before he comes, or would he read it after he gets here? Okay, I'll ask it. Okay. okay thanks. thanks a lot, George. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. And thank you to our team for putting that Ken Burns effect in the background. I had this first time I'd seen that. That looks really, really good. Um, and so I want to turn to Alfred now to, to tell us about how you tracked George down. We knew he was from Berryville, yeah. but how did we get to go and talk to his, uh, his friends and neighbors? So the story starts, starts off, as you know, you were contacted by Nick Drake, and he wanted to flush out George's character a bit. So you called me into your office, and we had a conversation about it. And I was like, oh, well, that's interesting. I, you know, I wouldn't mind taking a look at it and figuring <laughs> out who George is. And I remember leaving your office, and I said to myself, George Thomas. I was like, who? JFK's valet? What, what could we possibly learn more that we don't already know already? So I remember, OK, I'll, I'll do it. I'll try it out. So I remember um, going up, and you know, fir first thing I put in was George Thomas, JFK valet. And about the third search item down, I found uh, the White House Historical Association's piece on presidential valets. And about halfway through the paper, there's two lines for George Thomas. All he got was two lines, nothing more than that. I was a little disheartened by that. <laughs> so, you know, I, so I can't, I can't, now this was over. Now the challenge was on. Yeah, the <laughs> challenge was on at that point. And it's about, it's about a day or two after I'd gone through and tried to find everything. I had found his obituary after that, and that was all I could locate. So I came down to Barbara's office, I mean, defeated look on my face. And I was like, Barbara, I can't really find anything about George. I'm not, I'm not sure, you know, what more there is to flush out his character. So then Barbara went up to her, to her shrine of the Kennedys <laughs> and uh, found, and then that's when we actually talked to Sheila and she actually found us the excerpt from um, the uh, interview right. with uh, George Thomas. And uh, from that piece, we find that little quote in Dallas where JFK turns around to George as they're getting off Air Force One. He's like, this is a bigger town than where you are from, right, George? And George says, well, in the interview, I'm from Berryville. It's a small place. And so the last words that George says to the president, the president's stepping off of Air Force One at Love Field, getting ready to go in the motorcade, is he turns back to George and says, it's just a bigger town than you're from, George. Mm -hmm. They banter. Yep. And then, uh, so, I, so once I found out he's from Berryville, I was like, all right, where's Berryville? It's Clark County. So I, I called the Clark County clerk's office and got in touch with a gentleman there. He didn't, I told him about the project, but he didn't have much information that he can offer me. Mm 
but he did put me in contact with someone from the uh, Clark County Historical Association. So I got in contact with a lady there. Her name was Mary Moore. She's an archivist there. And I, uh, you know, I was on the phone with her for about 30 minutes, you know, telling her about the project. And she, she seemed really enthusiastic and, you know, energetic about it. So she said, you know, let me put you in touch with someone I think will be better equipped to help you which was Norma Johnson from the Josephine School Community Museum. Right in Berryville. Right, right in the heart of Berryville. And so first time I called, got no answer. So I was like, OK, maybe she's out to lunch, busy or something. <laughs> so I will, I, will, I will hold off. So I waited till that afternoon, called her back, didn't get an answer. So I was like, OK, I'm going to leave a message this time. Left a message. So I waited like a day or two, called her back third time. Didn't get an answer. Okay, this lady needs to pick up the phone. <laughs> <laughs> so I, so the. And the reason we love working with Alfred is he is determined. <laughs> he does not take no answer for an answer. Detective Green. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I called her for the fourth time, and she finally picked up. So I was like, I, I almost wanted to jump out of my seat a little bit, and I was on the phone with Norma for at least an hour. We were just talking about George and talking about his friends and everyone he knew in Berryville and how they, you know, they're interested in the project and everything. So but I was like, we had no idea yeah. that there, we, we didn't know if he had any family left. Yeah. He came from a big family. We didn't know if he had any family members there left. And so she put us in touch then with um, Joan, yep, right? Joan Payne. Is right in the middle there. And, uh, and then Teddy Brooks. Yeah, Randolph Teddy Brooks and Norma Johnson is right there. Uh, Teddy is actually a World War II vet. And 94. 94. And when we went to speak with him, he was the most energetic one of the group. So, <laughs> I, I, so I, I got really attached to him and was just carrying on a conversation with him the whole time. He was in on the D-Day invasion yes. and marched across Europe. Yeah. To, to Germany yeah. uh, in, in World War II and was so proud to wear his World War II hat and then we yeah. have a picture of them that he donated to the museum there of him in yeah. full full uniform and we also got to see the house mm -hmm. that George's mother built when he was a child and that he kept coming back to it's right there on the left yeah. is this little house in Berryville that he and his brother used to sit out on the porch and Joan grew up at the house next door yeah. so she would see him and every opportunity this speaks volumes we think mm -hmm. every opportunity here he was living in the White House but he'd come back on come weekends. back home on weekends and they said he'd usually be on the porch reading a book and he was all now th this is where he the prankster side of himself comes in um, that as Joan said the children would go out and say hi George he wouldn't answer them and then they would see him later that day he's like George I saw you on the porch why didn't you say hi it's like oh no that wasn't me that was James <laughs> <laughs> When, when, in actuality, it was him. So <laughs> he kind of played on the fact that him and James looked alike. So, right. right. Yeah. And the, but the kids loved him. She said we just adored him, and he'd he'd give us a five dollar bill every now and mm -hmm. again, or he'd send us down to the local corner grocery to get, get him some cigarettes. cigarettes. Yep. And, and then he and Teddy, Teddy worked in Washington and doing like construction and mm -hmm. commuted every day from Berryville to so Washington. So on those Fridays, he would catch a ride with Teddy and come back home to Berryville. And then they'd sit and play poker. Yep. They'd play poker in the weekend. Then I'd say, what'd you, what'd you do, Teddy, with your winnings? He said, well, George was the winner. He mm -hmm. went all the time. And then they'd go to the Charlestown racetrack across in, yep. in West Virginia. And, they, and, and at least Teddy said, and then I'd lose all that I'd won anyway. Yep. So I, <laughs> that's, that's, how we spend our, that's how we spend our weekends. Yep. Nick, I want to come back to you. Mm -hmm. How are you drawing um, George into the play? Think, starting with thinking he's a minor character, are you increasing the role that he is playing and you're, and you're increasing your focus on him? Yes, he's, he's one of the four characters in the play. And I want him to have equal value and equal status with, let's say, the mighty whitey guys. You know, it's, <laughs> he's he's got to, to be up there with them. Um, you know, he was with Kennedy all the time. He changed him, changed his clothes four or five times a day. He cleared up after him. And we're talking about a man who was the President of the United States who had a very, very bad back, who was often ill. He had a lot of back pain. And I'm with him on that, because I also have back pain. <laughs> so, so I empathize, you know. And it's not easy, necessarily, to get change when you're in that kind of position and you've got such 
pressure on you all the time. And he could, Kennedy at times when the back was his worst could not even bend over and tie his shoes. Mm -hmm. He needed George to put his shoes on and tie them for him. One of the things they did of the visit to Birch Grove was to search for a rocking chair, mm -hmm. especially to cope for Kennedy's right. back problems. And a, and a mattress, and a special yeah, mattress. mattress. He traveled floor, around, yeah. they tried, they'd always try to get an extra firm mattress for him, or a platform that, that the mattress could be put on that he could sleep on. So they were always trying to make these allowances for this terrible back, but also, as Nick said, a terribly ill man. Kennedy suffered from Addison's disease, which is an adrenal insufficiency, uh, leads to lots of infections. He had had back surgery to try to alleviate the back pain. It would go terribly bad, he almost died died from one of the surgeries in the 50s. The wound would not heal because of the Addison's. Um, so oftentimes we, we've read that George would have to carry him up and down stairs uh, in, in his homes in, in Georgetown. Um, so we also want to, to share with you um, what it's like for Kennedy to arrive at Birch Grove. Um, he stops off on a sentimental visit. Uh, David mentioned his sister Kathleen and that she had married into the Cavendish family, uh, the Hardington family. Uh, and sadly, her husband, Billy Hardington, was killed by a sniper uh, in September 1944 in Belgium. Uh, so he had come just after the invasion uh, and uh, was lost. Uh, she took up with another British nobleman, being of Irish uh, extraction, she somehow had a soft spot in her heart for British noblemen, as did yes. Kennedy. Uh, and so she took up with another British nobleman. To her parents' extreme upset, uh, this fellow was married and his divorce had not gone through, and worst of all, he was Protestant. Uh, and uh, <laughs> this very much upset her parents, uh, and they, Kathleen and her husband-to-be were flying to the Riviera, um, and they were then going to come back to Paris and meet with her dad and try to convince him that the marriage was, was kosher, uh, and their plane crashed in a storm. So Kennedy's sister was lost in 1948, and her grave was not too far from Birch Grove. So he first stopped off to visit. This is he emerging from the cemetery on his way to Birch Grove, which you can see is a lovely manor home in Sussex. Yeah. I and just want to add something. There, yes, actually, please. Because, because I think Kennedy found a moment to go and visit his sister's grave. He did not go to the funeral, and he had never been to her grave, but they were the closest siblings. And in the midst of an incredibly busy tour, and he'd just been to Ireland to visit his ancestral lands, he made time to go by helicopter to land at that place and visit his sister's grave. And then he went on from there to Birch Grove. So I think there's something very important going on in that moment. I think you're absolutely right, and I think he's in a particularly sentimental mood because of the, uh, the turnout for him. Uh, and now we're going to show you a British, this is a, a somewhat lengthier clip, a British clip from the newsreels. Remember newsreels of those days? This is from the British newsreel, Kennedy in Birch Grove. President Jack Kennedy is an hour late arriving at Gatwick Airport. He's been making an unscheduled visit to the grave of his sister Kathleen in Derbyshire. Few things are unscheduled in this tightly packed, heavily protected trip. Premier Harold Macmillan only has 24 hours of the President's time, and a lot to talk about. Nuclear test ban talks, and the mixed NATO fleet are high on the list. the airport a minimum of formality. The president is greeted first by the Lord Lieutenant of the County as protocol demands, then by Mr. Macmillan. I'm very glad to be back in England, he tells the Premier, and to welcome him back to England, a guard of honor of the RAF regiment. So within minutes, they are ready to leave for the Premier's home at Birch Grove in Sussex. In Macmillan's own words, Britain would have preferred the outward welcome, the opportunity to line the streets and cheer you. But our hearts go out to say to you, good luck. Vital talking starts the moment the two leaders are on their own. But next morning, Kennedy attends mass at the tiny chapel of Our Lady of the Forest at Forest Road with a hotline to Washington plugged in next door. 
G-men would have liked to hurry him past the crowd straight to his bulletproof Cadillac, but he pauses to chat with Father Charles Dolman, and then insist on meeting the villagers. This is the only unplanned five minutes in the whole 24 hours. And the worried G-men admit later he nearly gave his heart failure. But they get him away at last. Back to Birch Grove and those talks. The main achievement, agreement to go all out for a test ban treaty with Khrushchev. America had hoped at best for a partial ban, but Macmillan has convinced Kennedy that the chances of a complete ban are better than they have been. But on the question of a mixed crew NATO fleet of nuclear surface ships, everything in the garden is less lovely. It's being dropped for a time at least. Few people in Europe are keen on the idea, and to press it might endanger the success of the test ban talks. And those, President and Premier are agreed, are the most important item on the world's agenda right now. The big question, will agreement at Birch Grove lead to agreement in Moscow? Fascinating, isn't it? Um, we have just a couple more uh, points to make before we open things up to you, so be thinking of your questions and we'll bring a microphone to you. Um, but while I have David here, the historian, and someone who's writing a play based on history, um, one thing that Alfred and I discovered, one day we said, let's listen to Kennedy's civil rights speech from June of 1963. We listened to it about six times, I think. Well, I think I made us do that. <laughs> that's, I can never hear Kennedy too much. And Alfred, tell us the line that jumped out at us. Um, you know, he says, in the 100 years of delay have passed since President Lincoln freed the slaves, yet their heirs and grandsons are not fully free. And I, I think they're, you know, that, that whole line just stuck with us. And I think that's why we kept listening to it over and over again. We because kept saying, is, did he say that? Did he say the grandsons of slaves are not yet fully free? Because we had just read in one of the secondary works mm -hmm. that George was the grandson of enslaved people. Mm -hmm. And now I'm going to turn to David and, and Nick and say, how do historians know what they know, David? No. <laughs> <laughs> A simple question, to be minute. sure. You have one minute <laughs> to summarize. But what, we're, what our question is, did Kennedy and George talk about George's background? And isn't it amazing that he's being served by this man who's the grandson of enslaved people, and Kennedy puts that line in his civil rights speech where he announces what will become the Civil Rights Act of 1964. A, a hundred years of delay is too much. The, the sons, the grandsons of slaves are not yet fully free. David. We make it up as we go along. <laughs> um. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> You're allowed. You're not supposed to do that. <laughs> no, obviously, uh, one plows one's way through lots of archives. Uh, with, with Macmillan, it's, it's particularly easy. After all, he, he uh, came from the publishing firm and after being prime minister, uh, went back to being chairman of Macmillan Publishers. So it's not surprising you have six volumes of memoirs. <laughs> uh, you have three... Um, very fat volumes of diaries. Um, you have two, two other briefer memoirs. Yes, this is this is volume six, which has uh, at the end of the Birch day Grove, <laughs> Birch Grove in it. Uh, and you've also, of course, got the private correspondence and the official government correspondence as well. And you have things like uh, these newfangled uh, devices, oral histories, and. Uh, <laughs> Um, and the tapes. News reels and television coverage and so on. Uh, so uh, it's, it's actually interesting that if you work on British politics, uh, the amount of material available for the historian to look at escalates phenomenally after 1957 when Macmillan becomes Prime Minister. I, I would say the period 57-63 um, generate something like at least four times as much archival material as the previous six years, 51 to 57. Um, so there is just this explosion uh, of paper uh, and, and 
other materials uh, available for the historians. Good news to for, for Nick, right? To, to bear down on, on, on the, uh, the well, history. Yes, no. The, the diaries uh, are a bit disappointing uh, about Birchgrove because he didn't actually write them up uh, for eight days afterwards, and they're fairly curt uh, and don't go into great description. Uh, but the, the sixth volume is actually a must read if you're interested <laughs> in Birch Grove uh, because uh, it, it's very evocative. I think it, in many ways it provides the best description um, of uh, how Macmillan viewed Kennedy um, and talks about um, the great excitement in the whole area at the president's visit. Uh, the mobilization of school children uh, along the, the roadside to greet the president, uh, the spontaneous uh, crowd that gathered on the Sunday morning uh, when he went to mass. Uh, and Birchgrove, although as the newsreel says, there was discussion uh, about the, the, the coming test ban treaty negotiations where Averill Harriman represented the United States. Um, uh, and there was discussion about the mixed nuclear fleet. Uh, the British thought that was a ludicrous idea. Uh, and uh, Macmillan was very, very um, you know, derogatory in his dis discussions with, with Kennedy, uh, trying to, to, to persuade him that you know, this wasn't going anywhere, it wouldn't work, should be abandoned completely. Um, so there were some serious issues to be discussed at Birch Grove, but basically Birch Grove was a get to know, meet and greet, chat, have a, an informal session with Kennedy, find out how his uh, mind works, rather than a serious policy discussion. Those had taken place at Nassau and in the Bermudas uh, in 61, 62. This was, in a sense, almost a, a family get-together. There was a whole phalanx of advisors uh, uh, and diplomats, uh, and um, the helicopter sort of moved backwards and forwards uh, from Birchgrove uh, and uh, Brighton. Uh, which was turned into uh, the sort of the, the main American communication base uh, back to Washington. But it was essentially informal. Uh, it was at Macmillan's house. I don't think Kennedy actually ever went to number 10. Uh, it's interesting that uh, on all of his visits, uh, he never set foot inside Ten the Downing official... Street. And then partly, of course, uh, that can be explained that Macmillan didn't set foot inside <laughs> Ken Downing Street um, from 1960 to 1963 because it was being rebuilt. Uh, and the Prime Minister's official residence during those three years was Admiralty House rather than Number 10 Downing Street. Um, so it's perhaps not surprising that, that there's no visit to Number 10. But this was a, a family get-together and... and that was the whole emphasis, that some of the Americans were farmed out to, to Pooks, uh, which was Maurice Macmillan's house. Uh, they were dotted around uh, Birch Grove, uh, and uh, there was long informal discussion with the president, and relatively brief, uh, and not really particularly serious uh, negotiations on a formal setting. In fact, um, Kennedy and um, Macmillan uh, joked at the expense of their advisors talking about the future evolution of NATO. And perhaps it would be a good idea uh, to have a non-American commander of NATO. And Macmillan chimed in, yes, we could have an Italian or a German or a Frenchman, or, or perhaps even a Russian. <laughs> and, and one of the advisors, well, with the Prime Minister, of course, isn't meaning that seriously. And, and, and Macmillan went on, oh, yes, 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 I, I'm meaning it very seriously. After all, all they need to do is turn around and face eastwards <laughs> towards China. <laughs> uh, and um, so it was a very jocular rather than a formal discussion uh, of policy in meetings.
scenes. So David, let me pause there and say, it sounds in a way the perfect, of, of the five meetings or so that they had, it sounds like the perfect venue for, for Nick to choose rather than one of the other summits. Well, before you uh, move, that, let I me know, read no, just gonna, the last half, half the section. So far too soon the visit came to an end. It was time to go. He went as he came by helicopter. Um, we stood and waved. I can see the helicopter now, sailing down the valley above the heavily laden um, lush foliage of oaks and beech at the end of June. He was gone. Alas, I was never to see my friend again. Before those leaves had turned and fallen, he was snatched by an assassin's bullet from the service of his country and the whole world. So uh, the entry on Birch Groves provides uh, a vignette, really, of uh, Macmillan's respect uh, and memory uh, of the young uh, Kennedy. Well, and thank you for sharing that, because the, um, the Prime Minister also gives a beautiful eulogy for him in Parliament um, when Kennedy dies. And that'll bring us to our, our last slide um, that I'd like uh, Alfred to uh, point to, because we do raise the old question is, uh, no man is a hero to his valet, but we found that <coughs> in George's case, the president was his hero. Yeah. Um, so I have two quotes from uh, one of the, uh, his friends that we spoke with, Joan Payne, who was a treasure trove of information and power, some pretty powerful stories. Um, now I will preface this. The first quote I'm going to read to you does have a certain word in it that uh, may not be too kosher, it's the N word, but I'm gonna say it as she said it as to not take away from the impact of her story. I was working in the store called Silco and they came over the radio and at that time they had the registers higher than they usually are, just on the floor. And just as they announced it and we were going, we were all shocked and this white man came in, looked me dead straight in the face and he said they should have killed him a long time ago because he's a nigger lover. And I said, well, and that's all I could say, because I got, and then at that part, Joan seemed to get a little distraught. And uh, another quote that you have that when I read it, hurts me a little bit. And, uh, you know, I, I keep coming back to it because I, I feel a little bit of kinship with George a bit whenever I read this, so. She goes, this man from our little town who went on to work at the White House for the President of the United States and was never recognized for his achievements. Just let that sink in a little bit. It took us to bring his story to light. No one else bothered to tell his story. And I think that's important because that's what we do here at the Miller Center. We stud the presidency, and we bring stories like George to light. And so I ask that if you want to hear more stories like this, continue to come to events like this and support us so we can keep telling his story. And we're grateful, of course, to Nick for starting us down this road. Just so you'll know, George is in this picture at Arlington Cemetery, November 25th at the President's gravesite. He and Provy are just off to the, the right, right behind the family. If With that- If you look closely, yes, his eyes are closed. His eyes are closed. And we know that he never really recovered yeah. from the death of the president. He dressed President Kennedy for his funeral. He did. He dressed him for the casket, and he knew that Kennedy did not like the monogram on his handkerchief to show. He thought that was a little ostentatious, so he always told George, turn that around towards my body. And that way he did that for the last time, picked out his suit, and dressed him for the last time. Questions? Yes, we, if you'll wait for the microphone. And I, I always preface my remarks by saying, if you'll pretend you're on Jeopardy and, and put your comments in the form of a question. <laughs> what, what do we know about George from the assassination until he died? Until George own, died? Yes. Yeah. 
He went on to work for the um, head of the FDIC, uh, stayed in Washington, mm -hmm. um, was living near Howard University in an apartment, um, was uh, going downhill pretty quickly from heart disease, uh, and, and died in the Howard uh, University Hospital in Washington um, from that heart disease in 1980. I think it was 1980. Yeah, about 1980, at age 72. Yeah. Um, but one of his neighbors would go and visit him pretty frequently while he was working yeah, for the Teddy head of Brooks would go and see him on right. occasion. And, and Morita would go to yeah. see him they at the FDIC. They said that his, they could tell that his condition was worsening. He didn't really like to show it, but they, they could tell that and, he was And alone. the reason we, we have the question, no man is a hero to his valet, but he would tell Teddy, his friend, if John, he called him John F. Yeah. Didn't call him. Um, to his president, friends, the yeah, president called him, John called him John F. He'd say, John F. would have taken care of me, <laughs> which we thought was very poignant that he knew the president would have cared for him in, in his old age. <coughs> Other questions? Yes. When, uh, Hold on, which one minute for the mic. When George first began to serve John F., yes. he was a, a gift from this. Arthur uh, Croc, from, the from New Arthur York Croc. Times columnist. So do we know when, at what point did Kennedy start paying him and how much, what was, what was <laughs> Good question. <laughs> um, we do know that he didn't like Bobby Kennedy a lot because he had uh, went on to, he not only did he work for JFK, but he also at times would go and work for... I think he worked for Bobby's uh, in-laws yeah. for a while and Bobby yeah. apparently wasn't paying him. Mm -hmm. So he was not happy but about I, that. But judging from George's comments, like, if, you know, I knew John F. would have taken care of me, or he has a, this other quote that after the assassination, he says, everything had been going so smooth, and then this had to happen. So just judging from that information, it, it seems like JFK was more than... I, I was reading a, a book at Christmas about first ladies and first families and, and Christmases, and in the Kennedy section, they had a list of Mrs. Kennedy's Christmas gifts, uh, and they had checks for Provy, not didn't give the amount, but checks for Provy, checks for George, mm -hmm. uh, and a signed copy of the president's book. Uh, that they wanted them to have, and that Mrs. Kennedy, when, when the president died, was distributing the president's effects to friends and family members, and she wanted, you, you mentioned the, the rocking the chair, rocking chair yeah. being brought to Birch Grove. Uh, the president, to relieve his back pain, his doctors had recommended that he sit in a rocking chair, so you might remember famous photos of him in the Oval Office sitting in his rocking chair, and they had them in all of his rooms, and Mrs. Kennedy specifically wanted the one that had been in his bedroom to go to George. Uh, and as we understand it then, when George passed, that passed to a, uh, he never married, by the way. He did not marry or father children, mm -hmm. uh, but he did have nieces and nephews, and apparently the rocking chair one passed to one of them, yeah. and it was auctioned off some years ago. But we, we, at this point, we haven't, Nick, have you found anything about payments? No. What the president paid, we, so no. we don't have that at this point, but we may find that in the Kennedy Library. Mm -hmm. Other questions, comments? Yes. I was going to ask a question, but this young lady kind of did the first part of, of my question. But I'm wondering if valets are automatically put on federal payroll, are they able to accrue federal benefits? And if yes, was... Um, I uh, think I did read that at one point mm -hmm. when, the, when he became president, I think both Provy and uh, George were put on the federal payroll. I'm not sure what benefits would have been available generally at that time um, or to them specifically. Um, but I, th I think I came across in Mrs. Kennedy's oral history that she mentions that he had been, that George, when the president became the president, was put on the federal <coughs> payroll. That, that's a very good question. Thank you, too. Others? Thanks for being with us for the panel this morning. Um, a question for Mr. Drake. I remember a play that was, I think it was called A Walk in the Woods, and it was an imagined conversation between some Cold War leaders. Um, and since you don't have record necessarily of everything they discussed about, I was curious about your process of imagining dialogue between world leaders or between a man like Mr. Thomas and world leaders. 
That, that is a really terrifying question. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going to obey that for a moment. The Walk in the Woods is, I think, between uh, two diplomats representing both sides. It's a really terrific play. Um, okay, so, um, you know, drama is about people, about character, and character is about decision and action under pressure. That's what we look for. Um, the way people speak is very important, but it's also what they don't say is very important as well. And Ibsen said with characters, as you go through the different drafts of the play, that the first draft, it's as if you're on a long train journey with your characters. And on the second draft, it's as if you're having a long weekend with the characters and you know them better. And by the third draft, it's as if you've known them all their lives. <laughs> and that, has, that feels true to me, especially with that really daunting task of thinking, you know, how on earth am I going to get Kennedy to speak? How am I going to get my to speak? How am I going to get George Thomas to speak? But of course, you know, the, the challenge of writing anything is to get to the end, to do it, to try it. And so it's taken, if I went back to the very first draft, I'd be ashamed of it. It's awful. But you have to keep working at it. And as you get your, you have to get your ear tuned in to your imagination of their speech, but it comes from research, it comes from listening to things, um, it comes from trying to tune into the kind of the speech patterns, the cadences, the rhythms of how people speak, but also what it is that they need to say and what it is they can't say. So it's not a science at all. It's a, a, it's a process of kind of uncovery, of trying to take away what I think they sound like to what emerges in the process of, of the writing. Because you know when you're writing that when they start to say things you didn't expect them to say, that something's happening something which is beyond, your, beyond yourself. And it's you know, hard not to think of it as a kind of magical thing that happens, but you have to do an enormous amount of work for that possibility to, to arise. But, but it's the thing. And the other thing, of course, you want to do as a writer is you want to create great roles for actors who would want to play them. So whatever it is you create, how, whether it's authentic or not, that actor has got to be able to believe in every word, believe in the necessity of that word being spoken at that moment and the reasons for it. So that's, um, that's the kind of process that I, I try and go through. That's the art. That's, that's the, the art. art, isn't that's it? That's the art, yeah. Uh, we have two, Christina, here and here. Um, I think if George Thomas were here today, we'd have a thousand questions that we'd, we'd like to ask him. And it, I just find it so curious that with the hundreds of books that have been written by, on JFK, that he wasn't, that some historian uh, didn't interview him and there's no record of um, all the years that he was in JF, with JFK, particularly uh, with his personal life and his public life. And how do you account for that? Historians are rather snooty. <laughs> <laughs> They but not David. <laughs> they <laughs> and uh, 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 historians are very, very skeptical about oral history. They think if you talk to participants of things, you get maybe a feeling for the environment, the context. But history, if you want the detail, old men forget. And it is always my experience has been that um, it's better to go back to the paperwork, to go back to the, the original material from the State Department or the, the presidential diary or whatever to get the, the actual, what actually happened, that you cannot rely on memory. It is invariably distorted and inaccurate. Uh, and therefore, it doesn't surprise me that a historian uh, interested in, in, in the sort of macro level of the Kennedy administration um, didn't interview him, or indeed probably didn't interview the Secretary of State either, uh, because the kind of detail that historians are interested in, um, I think they're very, very skeptical uh, about being able to access that through talking to somebody 30, 40, 50 years later. Um, it just doesn't work like that. Even five months later, it doesn't work like that. 
so I'm in very dangerous territory Yes, here you are. Because <laughs> this is what Barbara does. Uh, As co-chair of the oral history <laughs> program, um, this but, is what we fight about at dinners. Um, historians, I think, uh, 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 have a very drawn dispute about oral history. But you, you also raise a good question. Why didn't anyone interview him? Now, we do have the one interview that Alfred discovered yes. from William Manchester um, that's quite short and mostly about Dallas and, mm -hmm. and the aftermath of Dallas. But we do have an oral history of Pro V. Paredes, uh, Mrs. Kennedy's maid. So we do find it odd that, again, Mark double-checked at the Kennedy Library. There is apparently no oral history of George Thomas. So part of it is uh, what David said. Uh, part of it is the, the great white man theory of history that didn't care about these individuals for so long. Um, and now we are caring about them and we're finding their stories. Um, I find it interesting that George did not write a book when many people who worked for the Kennedys, including the White House nanny, called her book White House Nanny, Maud mm -hmm. Shaw wrote a book, uh, Mrs. Lincoln, Evelyn Lincoln, the secretary to the president for 12 years wrote a book, uh, some of Rose Kennedy's secretaries wrote books, so lots of people, as you can imagine, who worked for them wanted to turn a buck by writing the inside yep. story of them. We think, Alfred and I, and we said We had this learned from his, his friends that he was very discreet in everything about the Kennedys. He did not, he was what you'd want your butler or your valet to be. He, they said, we, we outright asked, yeah. did he ever talk about the president's personal life? They would even send the kids up to and try to ask, see if they would <laughs> ask George about the Kennedys and he wouldn't tell them because he said they would probably go off and run them out. So he was completely discreet. He was the soul of discretion, and we think he took to his grave, which we're still trying to, we're find. Still trying to find. Alfred and I tried to track it down in Berryville in the midst of a hurricane, and we couldn't find it. Yeah. And now we think it's possible that he's buried in Washington. But we think he, he took that to his grave. I will say to you that um, I went back and looked at Mimi Alford's book when we started doing mm -hmm. our research. She was the intern in the White House who claims that she had an affair with the president while she was an intern at the White House and while he was president. And her book came out in about 2011, I think, about the time that Mrs. Kennedy's oral history was released by Caroline. And Mevi Alford mentions George a couple times in the book. Mm -hmm. And she says he would knock on the president's door and if Mrs. Kennedy was off somewhere traveling, um, Mimi Alford would stay overnight and stay in the president's bedroom and she said George treated me beautifully and never turned a hair you know he just would open the door and if I'd be there he would treat me Later. with respect and he would go about his business um, so that's the only connection I can find so far in my readings and you have to decide whether you believe Mimi Alford's book as my brother a journalist and lawyer said she was writing about everybody who's passed so it's only her story and it, it has a ring of truth to it but this is what we are here to make these decisions on. I mean, I think there's, there's, there's another thing as well in that, yes. because um, uh, I think that discretion is right, and it must have been a necessary uh, qualification mm -hmm. to do that job. And by God, you know, the things that he could talk about mm -hmm. if he was able to talk about it. But because he had such respect for him, he would never want to do that. And in fact, he did, I think, make one, one announcement about the number of shoes that, that, that JFK had. To a, to a journalist, he said he had 26 pairs of shoes, and he got ripped off for that by Kennedy, because he said it made him sound like he wasn't a man of the people. He said, George, how many pairs of shoes do you have? And George said one, and he sort of said, I rest my case. <laughs> yeah. You know, if, I don't want the people to know that, how does that make it sound? Yeah. That I say I have 26, when you say I have 26 pairs of shoes, it was just an innocent comment, he was just telling the truth. I think, did we have another? Yes. Collaborative nature and the and the involvement of the Miller Center. Is there any chance we'll see this play performed at UVA? <gasps> Nick, good question for Nick. Your first, <laughs> your first gig. Well, I don't know. <laughs> if there are, if there are any producers in the audience, come come see me afterwards. Barbara's got her own production company. <laughs> Well. Yeah, I'm, I agree, and I'm also thinking of Boston and the mm -hmm. Kennedy Library. Yeah. They're just do, they're yeah. doing a program there um, in a few weeks yeah. on race, discovering race through drama. Mm -hmm. um, that would be, it seems, a, a likely result. Uh, yeah. Why not Broadway? Why not Broadway? <laughs> why, not? <laughs> why not? Why not a world tour? <laughs>
I think we have one last question. Did we? Does someone in the back? No. Well, I think we're, we're past our time, but that shows how interested you were. Thank you all for being here today, and thank our lovely panel.